Hello, I'm Emma Hall and I'm the Pagan Federation's Advocacy Officer and Regional Coordinator for Lincolnshire. Today I'm sat in my secret space. Um, some of you have seen this before, um, some of you won't, so here we go. It's a mix of shrines and altars and various bits and pieces, but it is my sacred space um, and it felt right to share it with you guys today because actually today's talk is on quantum theory and it's rolling witchcraft. Um, when I first came to witchcraft, um, I was introduced to quantum theory, and I'm not going to lie, it blew my brain. I just could not comprehend this. Um, I gave up physics at school at GCSE level, um, which gives you an idea of how well versed I was at physics. Um, and that's classical physics, let alone anything else. Um, and I really struggled with the idea, I just could not get my brain around certain things. Um, Anyway, I was fortunate enough to have discovered a book, this book. How to Teach Quantum Physics to Your Dog by a guy called Chad Orzel. I have to say this book is really, really good because it made me understand. And if it can make me understand, well, there's hope for everybody. Um, because seriously, I actually, literally, my brain just says no when it comes to things like physics and particularly quantum physics. Just that whole mind-blowing ideas that were like no can't possibly no can't compute um this book really helps so if you're interested in quantum theory but you struggle like me um get it it's available i believe on amazon i got mine second hand for not a lot of money um but well worth reading anyway today's talk um is uh, as i said on quantum theory and its role in witchcraft which is actually a really close to my heart and so I'm asking you guys all to be nice today because um, I'm a bit nervous about this because it's a practice I don't share. This is my very personal practice um, that people don't see. So this is, I say, quite special to me. Um, so bear with me um, and I hope you all enjoy it um, as much as I did writing it um, because I had to think about it. Um, but uh, please be nice, guys. <laughs> anyway, so... I came, first came across quantum theory as I first started looking into witchcraft um, and fortunately enough discovered the book I just talked about um, and it really really helped me understand um, and so it gave me that basis so that I could go and read more and learn more and understand more because I think it's kind of like your, your knowledge of that sort of thing it's like a brick wall if the foundations aren't secure you, it's going to crumble down and you're not going to get very far you're not going to be able to build on it and that book really helped. So I thought I'd start in about 1900 um, with a German scientist by the name of Max Planck. Now, up until 1900, scientists um, couldn't agree as to whether light was a wave or a stream of tiny particles. Max Planck found a problem with the wave model of light. And although he's often given the credit for inventing the idea of light quanta, Planck never really believed that light came in discrete quanta. So it wasn't until 1905, five years later, that Einstein used light as a quantum particle to explain the photoelectric effect. Basically, when you shine a light on a piece of metal, electrons come out. Um, this is... I think this was in 1905, because... This uh, forms the, um, the basis of light detectors and motion sensors that we use today. And this theory disproved the, the, the wave effect and gave credibility to the theory that light was a stream of particles. Einstein's theory was pretty unpopular. And in 1916, an American physicist, a guy called Robert Millikan, set out to disprove Einstein's theory. Millikan's experiment actually proved Einstein's theory to be correct but it was still pretty unpopular within the scientific community um, and it still wasn't fully accepted until about 1923 when Arthur Holly Compton another physicist all these really clever people that did really clever things um, he did um, well, he did some experiments involving x-rays um, and that demonstrated that unmistakably particle-like behavior from light and it was then accepted I don't know why it took somebody else doing it, not Einstein, but I don't know. But that's history. Um, 
it was then accepted and Einstein, Millikan and Compton all won Nobel Prizes um, for demonstrating the particle nature of light. Also in 1923, French PhD student De Broglie, De Broglie made the radical suggestion that there ought to be symmetry between the light and matter. If light waves behave like particles, shouldn't particles behave like waves? Um, I'm going to cut to the chase on this because that's really complicated this bit and I still don't quite get it. But um, So the long and short of it is that the quantum particle was discovered and everything in the universe is built of these quantum particles. In layman's terms, subatomic energy exhibits the characteristics of both waves and particles, but not at the same time. Um, again, little brain couldn't cope with this. It took me ages to get my head around this theory and that, that book which deals it in terms of dogs, squirrels and trees. Fabulous. Although the two manifestations of energy seem to be contradictory, they're not. They simply indicate the shape-shifting nature of reality. This was so progressive that Einstein himself said, it was as if the ground had been pulled out from under me with no firm foundation to be seen anywhere upon which one could have built. Basically, solid matter does not exist as it appears to us. The particles of which objects are made do not behave like the solid objects of classical physics, like a chair or table. Subatomic particles are abstract entities, and the way they appear and behave depends on how we look at them. To quote F. David Peat, the universe springs from a, a creative source, out of which the orders of consciousness and the material world unfold. The heart of this movement and hierarchy of levels is meaning or knowledge. Consciousness in all its forms, human, animal, plant, spirit, lies at the heart of the universe. Consciousness lies at the heart of magic and is the reason that the power of magic really works. A witch's consciousness can affect change in the physical world. Based on what we know from subatomic experiments, what we see and how what we see behaves depends on our participation, our effort and our involvement. As physicist John Wheeler says, the old world observer simply has to be crossed off the books and we must put in the new word participator. In this way, we've come to realise that the universe is a participatory experience. See, we're all contributing to the universe. We're all making things happen. Um, and just thinking that something little you do um, is impacted in the universe and has this effect is amazing. Um, or it is to me, but I'm, I'm easily pleased. Um, if you're familiar with Laurie Cabot and her style of witchcraft, you all know that she founded a science tradition um, and this was based on quantum theory and the metic principles that parallel the principles of quantum theory. Pythagoras himself was versed in the hermetic principles as were the druids. Um, it isn't entirely clear whether Pythagoras received his hermetic teaching from the druids or whether the druids taught Pythagoras, um, although more recent evidence would suggest the latter. So, the Hermetic Laws, there are seven of them. So I'm going to go through them um, in not too much detail. I don't want to bore everybody to death and blind them with science. But I'm, I'm going to give kind of a background and an idea and then maybe you can see how you utilise it yourself in your work. So, the Law of Mentalism. The universe is mind. All the phenomenal world or universe is simply a mental creation of the all and that the universe has its existence in the mind of the all. All creation is composed of the divine mind, and it continues to live and move and have its being in the divine consciousness. F. David Peet says, Behind the phenomena of the material world lies a generative and formative order called the objective intelligence. And Bentov, in Stalking the Wild Pendulum, says, The universe and all matter is consciousness in process of evolving. Physicists have discovered that the basic shift of the universe, matter and energy, is really information. This is the information encoded into DNA structures. 
that form a shape and all life. We find laws, information and principles encoded in every crystal, plant, rock or drop of water. Um, so, move on to the law of correspondence. As above, so below. So below, as above. <clears throat> this is such an important part of the craft, particularly in my mind. Um, we live in more than one world. The physical plane and the spaceless, timeless realm, independent of the physical universe. We are so focused on the microcosm that we forget the macrocosm. Physicists discovered that the universe is holographic in nature. I know, that really blew my mind. If a hologram is broken into any number of pieces, the original picture is not shattered, but duplicated into as many pieces as there are. So it was physicist David Bohm who applied this principle to the, suggest that at some deep level of reality, our universe is a hologram. Um, and within that, particles do not exist as separate entities, but are merely extensions of the fundamental substance of the universe which is holographic and ind indivisible. In Laurie Cabot's book, The Power of the Witch, she describes an experience in Death Valley where she saw an old train go hurtling across the desert. Not only had the type of train not been used in generations, but there were no tracks there. Fifteen other people also saw this train with her. She suggests that the holographic nature of the universe would explain sightings like these. As then, so now. Another application of the law of correspondence. And that's certainly something that I think about a lot. You know, when people see things, and I have, I've seen things that I can't explain. And um, when other people are talking about, <sighs> there has to be a reason. There has to, you know, there has to be an explanation. We just don't know what it is. And quite often that theory um, is one that sticks with me. And I think maybe, you know, that, that sounds like it's credible. Um, I'm not a scientist. And just going on what other scientists said. So I don't know how you guys feel about this sort of thing, but certainly something to think about. Um, and I hope that's what this talk is going to do, is going to give you something to think about. Okay, the next uh, hermetic principle, the law of vibration. Everything moves and vibrates at its own rate. Capra describes it that all material objects of our environment are made of atoms and that the enormous variety of molecular structures are not rigid or motionless, but oscillate according to the temperature and in harmony with the thermal vibrations of their environment. Matter is not passive and inert, but restless with rhythm and motion. Laurie Cabot describes it as dancing. I quite like that description. It's the law of vibration that explains things like dousing, and curly in photography, as well as why many feel energy when touching things. Um, for example, crystals, rocks, that kind of thing, you know, and people. Um, it also explains the old hippie concept of bad vibes and good vibes. We send messages um, and information by the energy we radiate. And I think um, we all, at some level, even, even the most unenlightened of us, can actually get a feeling about somebody, but they won't put it down to, to their energy or vibrations. Um, but it, I certainly do. You know, if I meet somebody new, sometimes I come away and I feel awful. I was like, oh, I feel drained of energy. I've got a headache. Um, and that's because of the, the energy they're giving out. The, the messages and the information they're sending us that we're picking up is making us feel like that. Um, Again, it's time to... I can't put my phone down to show you this. I would say if you rubbed your hands together really quickly and you'd feel the energy pinging... Um, I'm sorry I made the camera wobble. That's me actually doing that, rubbing my hands together to make the energy ping. I don't know why I did it. I you can't see it. Um, but if you do that um, and make the energy ping, you can feel that energy that's coming off you. Um, and then when you start to be able to feel that energy, you can start to feel it on something else, like on a, a crystal or a rock... Um, stones that you pick up outside, a tree. I mean, I do it, and I don't know, um, my kids do it. My youngest will quite often go and just feel a tree's energy. Um, and she's really sweet because she's, well, people think I'm mad. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> it's quite normal because, you know, to me, is I can feel it, and therefore it is. Um, so anyway, we'll move on. Um, again, 
give it a go see see have a play have a play with energy see what you can feel um and then we'll move on to the law of polarity and this is a good one for me so everything is dual everything contains its opposite opposites are really only two extremes of the same thing with many varying degrees between them so i kind of want to think about magic itself now um we can use magic to harm or heal and harming and healing are both opposites of exactly the same scale um and i'm going to digress slightly because i kind of want to talk about that now i kind of want to talk about um the difference um between harming and healing and why i don't like people describing magic as black or white because to me it's not it's just magic it's what you're doing whether harming or healing different ends of the same scale which is magic so i'm going to give you an example so when somebody says they only do good i want you to think about the almost opposite of the same scale of what's going to happen when you do we you think you're doing good okay so as an example your partner plays for a football team like a saturday club thing i don't know um and there's a big match coming up at the weekend that he really wants to play in so you think you're being nice um and you decide to cast a spell so that he can play and yeah your intention's good but in doing the spell you cause another player player to break their leg in order to enable your partner to come off the suspension play in the match um, and whilst you thought you were doing good, you didn't consider the equal and opposite reaction, which involved harm to somebody else. Um, for me, it's always important to remember the equal and opposite reaction when working magic. Don't think of magic in terms of black and white. Think of it as, if I do something, what's the what's the effect going to be on somebody else? What's the what um, equal and opposite reaction is there going to be? Um, So, um, I kind of think that that's an area that's quite important and it isn't discussed very often and I'm, I, I'm aware I've only briefly touched upon it. But when you're magic, when you're working magic, um, I, I kind of consider it as, I don't know if you're familiar with the double entry bookkeeping system that bookkeepers use. So when you give to some place, you have to take from some place else. And that's kind of like magic. Um, and although I've digressed quite a lot from the law of polarity, um, I think it's worth I thought it was worth mentioning that for everybody. So I'm going to move on quickly, so I'm not boring you all to death. Um, the law of rhythm. Life is rhythmical. Breathing is a circular process. The wheel of the year is a good example. The cycle of life, the cyclic nature of the moon. Capra says that the rhythm of creation and destruction is not only manifest in the turn of the seasons and in the birth and death of all living creatures, but is also the very essence of inorganic matter. So there's only a very little touch on the law of rhythm. Um, again, it's things to think about. It's um, So go and look um, at the moon. I mean, look at the moon cycle. So what the law of rhythm is saying is everything has a rhythm. Everything has this rhythmical nature and quite often it's circular. Um, again, if you sit and breathe when you do your breathing exercises, pay attention to that rhythm. Your whole life is you stop breathing, you stop living. So your whole life is there in this cycle, this very simple cycle that we don't notice. You're breathing in, you're breathing out. It's just a cycle. OK. And I'm going to move on to the law of gender. Now, when I first came across the law of gender, I was really concerned that it was going to say there's only masculine, there's only feminine, and it's going to be really offensive to a whole lot of people. And that's not the case. Um, and again, I think if you glance at something and don't really read it, you'll take the wrong element from that. But, so the law of gender here, everything has both masculine and feminine components. The law of gender is really about force and energy. In all things, there is a receptive feminine force and a projective or masculine energy. And as we've already seen in the law of polarity, all things contain their opposites. We are not looked, locked into a static gender role. 
no matter what our sex or how much we believe we should try to live up to uh, culturally determined myths like real men and real women. A witch should respect the feminine and masculine elements of his or her nature, even though one or the other may not operate in a fully conscious level. And I like that because hey, what we're saying is, yeah, okay, so we've all got a bit of everything in us. And it, we, uh, uh, when we're practising, we can give off masculine and feminine energy, despite, despite being... You know, if I was female, doesn't mean I can't work with masculine energy. I can. Um, and I think that also, when you really study the law of gender, you start to to understand that how fluid that gender can be. That, you know, it, how masculine or how feminine you are moves from one day to the next in all of us. Um, uh, so, again, something to think about. So I'm going to move on to the law of cause and effect. And I like this one. Nothing happens by chance. For every effect, there is a cause. Back to F. David P. He says, The chain of causality is in fact a complex network of causation. The more the limits of this network are extended, the more it is seen to stretch out over the entire Earth and ultimately the universe itself. This led him to conclude that everything causes everything else. So remember the hologram? In a holographic sense, the whole is in every part and everything. It interpenetrates everything. So using the law of effect, Capra states that the universe is not a collection of physical objects, as we may see it, but a complicated web of re relations between the various parts of a unified whole. To quote the Greek philosopher Proclus, all things are in us physically and through this we are naturally capable of knowing things. I love that idea that actually we're all connected to this this web of knowledge and we can we, we have an ability we use it to know things we can learn things. Um, so those are the seven hermetic principles. Um, I hope that it's given you some idea of well, just made you think about your practice and what you use and the things that you use a lot of um things you don't think about like the law of rhythm i never really thought about that 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 has always been and even even after studying it i, I still um kind of take that stuff for granted that stuff just happens things are cyclical in nature but it just happens and i don't overly think about it whereas the law of polarity um, the law of cause and effect some of those who use a, a lot the law of correspondence we're using those all the time in our in in our work um <clears throat> so i'm going to ask you guys now i mean if you can i'd love to hear feedback on how you're finding this in your work what you do um you know what you see regularly or what you're going to start introducing into your work or being mindful of or how you're going to practice things when you th what you're thinking about so like take the holograph for example and we and we imagine that you know we've done all this stuff and it's shattered and is now available in so many different time space continuums how amazing is that that, that you could have done that you could you could have done that piece of work sorry i'm waffling a bit because it just does blow my mind a little bit anyway so the hermetic principles from the base of many belief systems and occult practices for example crowley's um do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And that clearly comes from the law of mentalism. Um, and you'll start to see things like that appearing. You'll start to go, oh God, yeah, yeah, hermetic principle, I'll spot it. Um, so to finish, I thought it might be quite nice if I could read um, something called the Emerald Tablet, which um, is featured in Seth Cardora's Chaos Magic. So let me find it. So here we go, the Emerald Tablet. Truly, without deceit, certainly and absolutely, that which is below corresponds to that which is above. And that which is above corresponds to that which is below. To accomplish the miracle of one thing. And just as all things have come from one through the meditation of one, so all things proceed from this one thing in the same way. 
The sun is its father, its mother is the moon. The wind has carried it in his belly. It is nourished by the earth. It is the father of every perfected thing in the whole world. Its power is complete if it is converted into earth. Separate the earth from the fire, the subtle from the gross, gently and with great care. It rises from the earth to heaven and descends again to the earth and thereby receives power from above and below. By this means you shall attain the glory of the whole world. All obscurity will be clear to you. This is the strong power of all power. It overcomes everything subtle and penetrates everything solid. And this way was the world created. From this there will be amazing applications of which these are the means. Therefore I am called thrice greatest Hermes, holding three parts of the wisdom of the whole world. Herein have I completely explained the operation of the sun. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed putting it together because it did make me think um, and I needed that in lockdown. I think my brain's gone a bit mushy. I'm not I'm not thinking as much as I normally do. Um, and I really do hope that it's made you guys think a little bit too because that, that's what I wanted from this talk. I wanted something that made people go, oh yeah, yeah, let's think about that. Um, if you are interested, um, the books... Um, I've used today which I recommend which are really helpful so the last one Chaos Magic by Seth Cardora this is this book um, pretty good at explaining Chaos Magic which like a lot of things touches on hermetic principles and obviously for that reason quantum theory you'll start seeing things in a lot of places once you've realised it's there um, also I've banged on about how to teach quantum physics to your dog but I'm going to wave it at you again just one last time um that's just invaluable for people like me who just don't understand um and then finally um and i've mentioned laurie cabot um so finally this is power of the witch by laurie cabot and this is a really good book i cannot tell you how much i enjoyed that book and i'm quite dubious i've read some terrible books let's face it and i thought this one load of nonsense um laurie cabot's was fantastic um and until i actually stumbled across her work i wasn't a huge fan i just thought she was a bit of a show a showman i suppose um and then i came across her work and was like wow actually this is really there's some really good substance here um so definitely recommend that um again amazon i hate i hate using amazon but we all do it um amazon will have it and um, that's where I found mine. Again, a second-hand copy, so it wasn't expensive. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably... I'm going to sum up now. We're nearly at half an hour. I don't want to bore you all to death. Please do feel free to message me um, if you have questions or you want to discuss something. Or just to give me some feedback and say, yeah, actually, you're right. I, I have been utilising this or I've been doing this. Um, so I hope that, say, my, my talks made you think today. Um and I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and I hope to talk to you all soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Um,